Travis Todd. This is Greg Oddie. This is Tyson Edwards. This is Brett Maher. This is Dale Kicker. This is Eugene Glickovich. And you're listening to Amato's Fifth Quarter. is there, he makes the catch, what a windy road home it's been, but for the first time in 10 years, the Claxton Shield is back in Brisbane. Presenting to you, Liam, and the Melbourne Ice, the good old Well, hello everybody and welcome to episode number eight of Amato's Fifth Quarter. I'm your host, Dan, and today I'm very excited because we've got another big guest coming on the show. Today we're talking football, Australian football or soccer as it's known here. And today the special guest on Amato's Fifth Quarter is probably, well, for me personally, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, is the greatest goalkeeper we've ever seen in the A-League. Today, my special guest is Eugene Galekovic, who's coming on for a chat about his career in the A-League. He played, of course, for Melbourne Victory, Adelaide United, and Melbourne City, and also represented Australia at two FIFA World Cups. Unfortunately, he didn't actually play in a World Cup, but was a part of two World Cup squads. One thing most people don't know about him is, as a kid, he actually wanted to play AFL. That was his first sort of sport of choice, um, but obviously growing up in family with a European background. Unfortunately, his parents uh, didn't let him play. So the great Eugene Galekovic could have actually been an AFL player. You never know. No, the next best thing was was being a goalkeeper in the game of soccer. So that's where he, you know, he went towards and he ended up making a, a big career out of it. Going on his statistics and what he achieved in the A-League, he played 288 games in the A-League. He played 13 finals. He is a two-time A-League championship winner in 2007 with Melbourne Victory and, of course, 2016 with Adelaide United. He is a four-time A-League Goalkeeper of the Year, which is a record in the A-League, the most uh, Goal of the Year awards ever for one player. He's a two-time Adelaide United Player of the Year, a one-time Melbourne City Player of the Year award winner as well. He is an A-League All-Star representative He was the Adelaide United captain for several years. On five occasions, he was a part of the A-League team of the season, and he is also a part of the A-League team of the decade. And he was a part of the FFA Cup in 2014 with Adelaide United. And as I mentioned, he did represent the Socceroos in two World Cups, 2010 and 2014. He talks about a range of different topics. As I mentioned, his, um, I guess, ill-fated AFL career. He talks about the NSL era. He talks about his brief stint in Portugal where he played two games for Bira And then he talks about coming to the A-League, playing for Melbourne Victory, not getting a whole lot of game time, going to Adelaide United where, of course, he played the bulk of his career and really established himself as the best goalkeeper we've seen here in this league. He talks about Melbourne City as well in his last couple of years there and also playing for Australia and representing his country, a big moment for him. So I'm really excited about this one, but before I bring him on, I just want to remind everybody, if you could please just give me a a, a rating and a review on iTunes, that would really mean a lot to me because gaining as much positive feedback as possible helps boost the show's visibility and allows it to be seen by more people, which therefore gives me a bigger audience base, 
which therefore spreads the name of Amato's fifth quarter, which therefore gives me the opportunity to be able to get more guests on the show and make this podcast. Just having positive feedback and having people tell me, hey man, that, that was a really good episode. I really enjoyed the chat with this person and that person. That just means the world to me. So definitely hit me up with a rating and review if you've got some spare time. It would be awesome. Let's get into this episode. Let's bring him on from Melbourne Victory, Adelaide United, Melbourne City, and the Australian national team. It's Eugene Galekovic about to come onto the ground. Welcome back to Amado's Fifth Quarter, and we're very lucky to be joined by a huge guest today. It is Eugene Galekovic from Melbourne Victory, Adelaide United, Melbourne City, and the Australian national team. Eugene, thanks very much for coming on the show. No worries. Thanks for having me. I'm assuming the uh, the huge joke has probably passed its expiration date by now. You've probably heard that a million times. Yeah, I've had a few things in the past, but that's probably the main one. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene, it's, in the blink of an eye, it's already been 18 months since you retired. Your last game, of course, was the semi-final against Adelaide United, your old club. Um, obviously, the goalkeeping coach now at Adelaide United, but how have you how have you settled into retirement? Do you miss the game? And yeah, what have you you've been doing since you retired? Yeah, no, it's... Um... Um, I've enjoyed my uh, football career um, in terms of playing. Um, I've been tired and really missed it, I'll be honest. I, uh, you know, it was time for me. I retired at the age of like 37, 38, so I uh, had enough of the game pretty much. Um, I enjoyed it, but uh, it was time to give it up and then try something different and I had an opportunity um, you know, to coach goalkeepers and, and, and I took it with, uh, you know, took it, um, with both arms and um, really, uh, really enjoying it. And, um, Trying to um, you know improve uh, the goalkeepers I have down at Adelaide United. And how you how you finding coaching um, as opposed to playing something you obviously want to keep doing? Maybe one day go to the national team or, or sort of broaden your horizons. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. I um, you know it's from you know getting told you know um, you know what to do and, and how to goalkeep to now trying to implement my style on the goalkeepers we have here. So it's, it's really refreshing to see. Uh, goalkeepers are, are developing, and in terms of you know where I'm at in round, obviously uh, new in terms of uh, coaching. So I haven't really thought too too far ahead. It's more about trying to um, you know get a production line of goalkeepers at, at, at Lake United and really see it develop and move on to bigger and better things. And um, you know I'm in the early early stage of that, but um, you know really grateful and, and really happy um, you know that I got a job like this. Eugene, I just want to take you back to the beginning. You grew up in the southeast of Melbourne, and you're of Croatian heritage. Yeah, correct. And I remember watching a news segment on Channel Nine, probably about four or five years ago. You did with Warren Treadray, and you mentioned that you always loved the game of AFL, but obviously your parents, being of, of Croatian background, they didn't let you play. Yeah, correct. Um, I uh, always played AFL at school, and uh, you know, really enjoyed the game, and still do. Um, it was just one of them at a young age. My parents, uh, you know, thought it was a bit too rough, probably uh, a lot like a lot of uh, European parents. Um, and they didn't really, you know, let me play it. I could only play it at school. So I thought the next, next best thing was being a goalkeeper and trying to catch balls uh, around ball instead of an oval ball. So I got into that. Um, and to be fair, I, I never really enjoyed it. I was always in kind of good junior teams and the ball was never down my hand. So. I always, you know, wanted to be that player scoring goals, like well, probably any kind of goalkeeper. Goalkeeper does. They like scoring goals as well. So, uh, but I always get got thrown back into goals and just ended up staying there from an early age and um, kind of grateful. You know, they kind of went back there uh, all the time and um, you know had the kind of uh, career I did in the end. I, I really appreciate it and uh, you know that, that's just how life goes sometimes. So when you're when you're a young guy that, that starts playing football, are you identified by others as a goalkeeper? Yeah, well, the other thing was, um, you know, my dad used to always tell me, you know, I used to have to run more and uh, I was a bit of a chubby kid, so I never really know too much, so it was kind of like, I mean, it's probably where I was meant to be when I was a young, a young kid, but, uh, yeah, I think like most kids, they all like, uh, you know, they all like more sports, uh, you know, you feel cricket. I was also a cricketer as well, and I think my parents are great playing. Up playing cricket because uh, you know they, they didn't like it too much either. But um, it always ended up being soccer in the end. Um, you know my mates ended up playing soccer, and um, you know I just kind of uh, you know I, I played all sports, which is I think good for all kids to you know get different coordinations. Uh, you know hand, hand ball ball hand uh, coordinations, and uh, in the end, yeah, uh, goalkeeper it was. And was your was your father uh, a football person? 
Yeah, he was. Uh, he played, you know, as a, as a growing up, he, he played water polo back in uh, Croatia as well. He was a goalkeeper as well. Um, but, you know, not, 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 um, not a professional or anything, just enjoyed the game and, and played it at a lower level and uh, always loved football as well. Hmm. And when you are a goalkeeper, you're obviously, your fitness is different, your training is different. Do you ever, as a goalkeeper, feel, does a goalkeeper ever feel kind of isolated or, or for want of a better word, segregated from the group? Yeah, um, it's a degree. Um, it's understandable to, to a degree as well because it's, it's different fitness. So, you know, even in a normal training session, it's, you know, a good 20, 30 minutes, uh, just the goalkeepers by themselves doing their goalkeeper warm-up and goalkeeper um, exercises and then usually they join in you know, the, the last half of the training session. So, you know, there's ways around it. You know, you, you can sometimes make a warm-up with the players or, uh, you know, run up with the players and then um, come, come with me and then they do maybe possession with the players or a bit of shadow with the players just to keep them involved with the playing group as well because... Um, you know, you've got to enjoy your football and enjoy being around um, your teammates as well. So there's ways around it, but um, the, the, the main core of their fitness um, and strength and conditioning is, you know, different to what the players go through. Mm. And you did play football in the NSL for South Melbourne for, for, I think, three or four years. What are your memories of the NSL and at South Melbourne? And what are some of the differences you found between the old NSL and the A-League? Yeah, I played, um, I played one year at um, Gifford Dolker, that's where I started it, and I went to South Melbourne for three years. And, um, you know, it, it's the league, it was, a, it was the main league in Australia, and it was, it was a very, high, uh, very good quality league as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good players that kind of um, play in that league. A lot of those players, you know, kind of, there wasn't many players going overseas, so the majority, you know, played in, played in Australia, so it, it was very competitive uh, and, and a very good league. Um, it probably just didn't have uh, the, the structure in terms of, you know, you know the TV audiences, uh, the, the commercial side of things just wasn't there. That's that's where the A-League come and excel. They, um, you know, when the, the A-League um, started, it was marketed really well and started off on a good note and got, you know, bigger and better every year, kind of, uh, as the seasons went on. So, um, you know, now, now that exposure's there, the players are going out the seasons and, the good players kind of lead that lead to kind of a bit better thing. So, yeah, you need to kind of, kind of keep those players here and you know, improve the league and, um, you know, get the good foreigners to come in to make the league even better. So, it's, uh, you know, that, the, the big thing about the NSL was, I think, you know, a lot of the good Australian players kind of stayed in Australia. Um, and then, you know, the, the ones that excelled obviously went overseas. Hey guys, I know this chat is damn awesome, but we're going to have to take a quick break because I want to remind you guys that last week I had Dale Kickett on the show. Dale Kickett has got a fantastic story because he's one of the very rare AFL players that didn't just play for one club, didn't just play for two clubs, not three, not four, but five different AFL clubs. Played for Fitzroy, St. Kilda, the West Coast Eagles, Essendon, and of course the Fremantle Dockers. He has a remarkable story of how he went to each club and why it may not have worked out. Here's a little snippet of it. For that fleeting second after the siren went, that, that was great. For me, well, not so flash. Because I missed half a season. I suppose you could say I tainted myself in a not so good way. I lost a lot of money playing those games because contracts that I got towards the end of my career were, were performance-based. I suffered a little bit because I copped it from everywhere in Perth. If, if, you, if you know Perth, it's only a small place. Um, everywhere. My kids copped it at school. So I went through a bit of a, uh, I suppose you could say depression at the time. But yeah, so whilst that, the game might have been a spectacle for people outside, it wasn't so flash for me. And, and uh, you know, anyway. There's a lot. There's a lot to say about playing that game, but probably best left unsaid. <laughs> that was a little snippet of him remembering the demolition derby, where he got suspended for three separate striking incidences for nine games, and you know, a very difficult period in his life. That was despite the Fremantle win, 
the the effects that that had on him and his family were a lot more detrimental than the positives of the win. So definitely uh, tune into that one because it was an awesome episode and um, got a lot of positive feedback from it. But until then, let's get back to Eugene Galekovic. Yeah, because obviously like your Mark Badukas and, and Mark Schwarzers and these sort of guys all came through the NSL. They all started in that league. Yeah, correct. And they made a name for themselves in Australia. And once they made a name for themselves here, yeah, they went over where you're getting um, you know, young players that play a few games already getting overseas uh, in this day and age. So um, they don't get the really shame qualities um, until they kind of come back at an older age. Hmm. And just on that going overseas, you did have a short stint in Portugal. Is it is it pronounced Beira-Mar? Yeah, Beira-Mar. Yeah. Beira-Mar. So that was your, your only stint overseas. What are your memories from, from those days in Portugal? Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, at the time, it was the break in between uh, the NSL and the A-League. So we had a year off pretty much in Australia. Um, and it was either, you know, play in the local league or, or I had an opportunity that, um, that, you know, I kind of jumped at it. Um, I was in camp with the um, Olympic team in Athens um, and then and the opportunity came to, you know, go over after the Olympics. So, you know, like I said, I jumped at it and really enjoyed my time. Um, obviously, spent one year there, we ended up getting um, relegated, so we didn't do too well. Um, in terms of the football side of things, we, we had a uh, goalkeeper called Pedal Senecek. He was a he was at Newcastle United for a good ten years, and he was a Czech number one. And I didn't get, really get much game time. I got two games of the season. Um, yeah, and I was just, football wise, I was a bit frustrated. But I was young, like, you know, just want to play, and I didn't really have that opportunity. So um, yeah, I uh, I moved back to to Melbourne to play for Melbourne Victory. And when you're over there in Portugal or just overseas in general, how do you sort of adjust to the lifestyle and the language barrier and, and that sort of thing? Because I, I assume that's something that is is quite foreign to, to anyone, really. Yeah, I, I really enjoy it. I think, you know, the first thing you've got to, you know, your mindset is you've, you've got to buy into it. You've got to try to learn the language um, and, you know, try to get along with the local players and, and, you know, you've got to really buy into it. And I, I tried to learn the language, um, went to classes, um, don't know how to speak it now, it's been a long time, but I do still kind of understand where it's here and there, so, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, we had, it was a beautiful city, we were on the, um, nice little village and kind of close to the beach and stuff like that, so the lifestyle was really good, uh, people were really nice, and, and to be honest, a lot of them could speak English anyway, so, um, even though you try to learn it, you kind of, uh, did you ever gain, because you are one of the rare Australian players that really only played in the A-League, did you ever gain significant interest overseas? Uh, oh, not really. I, I, I don't know how much interest there was. You know, the agents are talking to saying, oh, this club's interested, that club's interested. But, um, yeah, I was Was it was it ever your something you were interested in to go to go overseas, or were you happy just to sort of play in Australia and, and be in the A League? Or if there was significant interest, would you have ever entertained that? Yeah, for sure. I think you know, if you talk to any football, I think you want to play the highest level as possible. And you know, I'm like different. I think uh, uh, you know, if if an offer did come to to play, you know, at a higher level, uh, you know, any player. Would have jumped at it, so you know I'm no different. I I was kind of you know at, at some stages of my career, you do look for these opportunities because you, you know your career doesn't last too long. So um, I was definitely interested. But just uh, you know, nothing really happened other than um, going to Portugal. That brings us into to your A League career because you were there for the first season of the A League um, for Melbourne Victory. You played I think 26 games for the, for the Victory, three seasons. And you were part of the 2007 Grand Final. What are your memories of Melbourne Victory and Ernie Merrick? Yeah, it, it was a good time. Um, it was 
that was a big tree uh, you know, the A League, so he was at the start of the A League, um, and you know the club's kind of just starting off, so it was pretty much you know um, the start of a, a club starting up. So he was starting from scratch, um, but you know it built up pretty quickly. Um, victory, obviously, uh, uh, you know. Now it's a big club, but even when we're starting off, we start off with massive crowds going over big parks, selling out. Um, so it started off on a really good note. Um, and you know, the first year we we did struggle. Um, I think we finished second last, and Ernie Merrick, Ernie Merrick, that um, second year kept saying we're the worst Australian team um, right now. Um, and you know, that kind of inspired us to to win the championship in the second year in the Premiership. And, Win it by a mile, to be honest. Uh, I think we won it by about five games remaining. So um, it was good times, a uh, very good squad. Um, and it built a very good squad in the second year. And, um, you know, it, it kind of, kind of, uh, we won everything. So, you know, credit to Ernie. Uh, he's a very good coach. Obviously, everywhere he's gone, he's got a bit of, bit of success. So, uh, you know, who knows if he's going to coach uh, coming up. But yeah, he's definitely one of the best coaches in, 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 in the A League. Yeah, because that, that second season, 2006-07, Victory, as, as you mentioned, were by far the best team in the in the competition. You had the likes of, obviously, Archie Thompson and Danny Allsop and, and Fred and these sort of guys. The 2007 Grand Final, obviously the, the darkest day in Adelaide United history, really, 6-0, Archie Thompson, best on ground. I'm really interested in this part of it because, say like with AFL, the Grand Final, if you are not in the 22 that play on the on the day you don't get a medal whereas with football even the subs who don't play they still get a medal as someone who wasn't at the time the starting keeper do you feel like you're as much a part of that 2007 championship as the the players who actually got to physically play in that game no you don't it's um it's still a great feeling don't get me wrong um on, on the actual day, you, you, you played really a minimal part of, of, of the game. Um, you know, that's just how it feels. Every, every player wants to play there. I want to be on the bench to do this. Even people in the grandstand that are more disappointed, um, but even more so as a goalkeeper. But, you, you know, you're pretty much on the bench. You don't even have that real chance unless something happens to the goalkeeper. So it's, it's you know, that, that feeling where it, it's still a great feeling and stuff like that. But um, being a part of playing a part, is completely different. So, um, you know, and you kind of learn, um, you know, over time when, in 2016 when we won it, you, you know, you know that feeling. So you try to make those people that have been on the bench or in the grandstand really, really, um, you know, make sure they're, they're a part of it. And, and um, they, you know, they feel like, you know, the players that have played, even though in their mind, they probably have that feeling where they haven't played a part, but you still try to make them feel like everyone's part of the group. Yeah, because it is like a club award. It's not just the the sixteen or the the eleven that are on the on the field. Correct, exactly. You know, it's not just winning that one game. It's, it's throughout the whole season. So everyone's played a part. Either one minute of you know round fourteen, or, or played a game, or, or played ten games, or played every single game. Everyone's played a <laughs> part in that whole season, not just that one game. And then you had another season at Victory, and then after that, you you moved on to Adelaide United, where you played nine, ten seasons at, at Adelaide United, that's obviously the bulk of your your career. Did you move to Adelaide United for for better opportunity? Yeah, I, uh, it was halfway through the third year. Um, I wasn't playing at Victory. Um, I think Victory were happy to let me go because they wanted to bring um, another player in. Um, and an opportunity came down to Adelaide where I think uh, Daniel Butch Beltrami got injured and I was just like a replacement. I think it was like an eight-week contract or something like that. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I came in and played a few games and then um, stayed there for another nine years. So yeah, had some really good times and probably you know, definitely my you know best part of my career where you know played a lot of games, played for the national team at that time, and um, yeah, made some really uh, you know good friends friends around the club as well. So what does Adelaide United mean to you? Because you, as you said, you spent you know nine, ten years there. You captained the club. You won championship there. You also won FFA Cup. I'm sure there's you know it does mean quite a bit to you. Yeah, no, for sure. I uh, you know I spent um, more than half my football career at the club. So you know, and I would 
you know, I think I've achieved the low in terms of, you know, one rest, all my, I did, most of my trade is down at this, uh, Adelaide United. Um, like I said, I represented my country while I was playing for the, for the club. Um, and, you know, it's, it's home, like I live here now. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm settled here. So even though I've got family in Melbourne, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm a kind of an Adelaide boy now. I live here and really enjoy it, love the city. Um, and, you know, the club's been, you know, tremendous to me for, you know, what I've done for the football club. So, um, yeah, really, really enjoyed it and, and loved the club. Eugene, I wouldn't mind just delving into the 2008 Asian Champions League because that was such a good team Adelaide United have and that seemed like it was the moment for Adelaide United to really do something special. But right around the country of Australia and new admirers around the continent of Asia. And we can't wait for this 90 minutes to follow. This is a real stage. Well, this is certainly the biggest game of club football ever played at Hindmarsh Stadium. It's a full house. It's sold out within one hour of going on sale. Gamba Osaka, Adelaide United, the final of the AFC Champions League for 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the AFC Champions League 2008, Gamba Osaka. You came so close, but unfortunately you just you just couldn't quite win it. Is that something you look back on now and, and do you look at it more with pride that you actually got to the Champions League final considering how much you were the underdogs, or do you look at it with the disappointment that you couldn't quite actually win it? Yeah, you, you look back now thinking that, you know, when you're there, you, you want to win it. Um, at the time, at the time, I think our semi-final, I think it was against um, Budnitko, I think that was a massive game for us. We knew if we won that, we were not just in the grand final, but we were in the um, Club World Cup. Um, so, you know, the, the aim was for the club to be in the Club World Cup. Um, a lot of money for the club if you, you get there. And we knew if we won that semi final, it was almost our grand final. Um, and, you know, we were built on um, being very good defensively. Um, it really uh, did my head us, you know, being really good defensively. And against Bunyut Court, we, we pulled three goals past them at, at, at home. And, uh, we, we thought, okay, we're, we're going to Japan to play the World Club Cup, but we're also going to final play as well against uh, Gamba Saka. And, you know, I don't, you know, depend, I don't know who you ask, but you kind of, uh, you, you could say almost that semi-final was our final. Um, like I said, we built very good uh, defensively, and then we went to the um, final against Gamba over there. They put three goals by us, but probably defensively we weren't that great. I think you know. You, you have players trying to, um, you know, go forward, um, score goals where maybe we should have just been, you know, a back four, um, two sixes to, to just not not concede. And uh, Gamba, like I said, put three goals past us and it made, us, made it very difficult to, you know, play at home and, and try, try to win that game, let alone score four goals. So, you know, it, you know in the end, Gamba deserved deserved it. So it's, it's uh, hard to put a finger on it, but yeah, it's... Our semi-final was the big one. What about some of the... Because Adelaide United was the first team to even advance to the knockout phase at that time. You were in Group E against the Pohang Steelers, Cheng Chang Yatai and Bin Duong. Some of the conditions you had to play in... I watched the documentary quickly last night and Aurelia Vidmar was talking about it was... Quite often when you travel it was very hot and the, the grass was real thick and real high. Even some of the, the conditions you had to adjust to. Travis Dodd was talking about how... Ange Casanzo bought an Italian coffee maker because the coffee there was so bad and he gave it to the staff and instead of putting it on a stove, they put it on like a frying pan and turned the gas on. You had to eat Vegemite sandwiches, Nutella sandwiches and there was chicken just in a pot of oil. Even before one of your games, there was a frog on the field. That sort of stuff you don't hear in Australia and, and that's really foreign. So what was that like to adjust to and was it funny at the time or was it did it distract you? I, I think, um, yeah, it was obviously, you know, all those things are true, um, you know, but you've got a bunch of boys that, that come together, it's, it's, it was really enjoyable to be honest, you know, you, you, all you're doing is pretty much playing games, there's not much training involved, the trainings are really high, so you, you, you know, you're flying to um, Asia, you, you're playing a game, you're coming back to Australia, playing, having a light training session, playing another game and, and flying in, so, you know, we had a really good bunch of boys, um, and a lot of those just 
distractions, you, you kind of just brush off in the end. And, and if anything, the harder it is, it, it makes you stronger as a group. And uh, that's probably what it did. We were, we were together a lot. It was like a one big family um, and really enjoyable. Um, every game every game was like a final. Like no one really gave us... Um, we, you know, we're always the underdog. Um, and every, every game was a big game. And, and one of those games you had to win because after the group stage, it was all knockout. So, um, or home and away knockout. So they're all big games. And um, you know, we always performed on, on the big stage. So that, that, that's the exciting part of it. You know, we had players like, like you said, Edge, um, Diego, you know, Fabian was there, um, Travis. A, a lot of a lot of these players. We all stood up on on the big stage. And, um, you know. It was, it was a good time. And what about the final game of, of the knockout against Chang Chang Yatai? You had a few nervy moments in goal. There was one time where you you fisted the ball like spoiled almost AFL style and it goes backwards over your head. Sasha Ogonovsky saves the ball with a header right on the line. Do you remember that moment? Yeah, I do. Um, we, I think we drew nil-nil, but all, all we needed was a draw, so it was, it was a win to us. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of those games were... You know, with the underdog, the, the the other team had a lot more money than us and spent more money on players, and we kind of knew that, um, and that's what we kind of uh, you know played on. And, um, every every time you saw the uh, heard the final whistle, it was like we were all celebrating. So, um, you know, especially that game, I think the the crowd was pretty hostile. I think I think Christian Sark he's copped a piece of metal to the eye at half time or after the game as well. Um, the crowd was, the crowd were throwing things at us, but. Uh, like I said, these kind of things just make you stronger. Referee says, fellas, take a break. It's half time. Hey everyone, I just want to say a very big thank you to those who have engaged with A5Q. I really do appreciate all the support. I trust you're enjoying delving into all things Australian sport and hopefully you will continue to stick around. It would be a massive help if you could please do me a solid. Subscribe to the podcast and hit me up with a rating and a review. Gaining as much positive feedback as possible helps boost my visibility and it allows the podcast to be seen by other Australian sports tragics out there. Now, enough of that. Let's get back into it because the second half of A5Q is about to get underway. The quarterfinal against the Kashima Antlers, you win that 2-1 on aggregate. The first leg just after half time, Robbie Cornthwaite scores an own goal. What do you think when you see that trickle past you? Oh, it's one of those just unfortunate things. Um, you know, but to Corny's credit, I think he, he ends up score, does he score the winner or the equaliser or something yeah. like that. So he, uh, you know, he, he, as long as you put those things, you know, in, at that time behind you, and you, and you, you, you try to get an outcome um, during that game, like Corny did. Um, it, you know, it's uh, credit to him. Um, and I, I remember that game being under the pump. Um, a lot of the game as well. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, we, we got away with it. I think we went over there and, and we won one 0 Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So, yeah, it was uh, good times. You briefly mentioned before the semi-final against Bunyard Core. Obviously, they're a bit, well, at, and at the time and still now, very wealthy club against a Zico coach side. You had Rivaldo there, who was massive at the time. He probably was paid more money than every A-League player combined, like that's that's how big this is. They had first-class air flights, but you beat them 3-1 on aggregate. Diego scores, is possibly a handball, but just to win that series alone, as you mentioned, is just, that was your final, wasn't it? Yeah, correct. Um, you know, everything, you know, before that game was, you know, all those little things kind of were going against us. We, I think we had an A-League game. Um, just before that game, and uh, they they flew, flew flew to Adelaide in a private jet uh, really early, maybe four or five days before the game, really fresh. Um, the momentum just got us through that game, and um, you know the, we we win three 0 at home. Um, and going over there, it's you know you don't feel safe three 0 uh, especially going to a country like Wood Newcore. Uh, a long flight. I think it took over thirty hours to get there, and we're yeah. in about you know transiting transiting in four different countries and when we got there I remember it just being really hostile um, the crowd was on top of us um, never stopped every time the ball went out um, you know they just put the ball back in straight away um, they, they just got the game moving really quick put us under a lot of pressure and um, the best thing for us was we didn't really consider in the first half so it was nearly at half time and they scored really late to really you know 
try to you know, get three goals back. So um, that's what really took the pressure off us. What about the second leg? Because you had a quad injury, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So, I, had a, I had a quad injury. Uh, I, think we, I think we played Brisbane in between. Um, and I did it the day before the Brisbane game when I didn't play against Brisbane. And I tried to get up for the second leg, which I got up. Yeah, yeah. It so, all, um, I got up and I still I, I, I could feel it. There was one of those where I had to miss it a couple, of week, a couple of games after that. So, yeah, it wasn't a problem. Because you didn't play in the second leg, did you, of that final? I got suspended in the... In the I got suspended, so I had an extra yellow... I got three yellow cards or something like that. Yeah, because yeah. uh, I think it was Mark Birigitti came in. Yeah, correct, yeah. yeah. Counterintuitive, because you've got to perform well in the A-League to qualify for the Champions League, but then you've got to play Champions League while you're doing the, the next A-League season. How do you juggle that? That's got to be just mentally, physically exhausting. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I think because we have small squads, it makes it tougher. Um, you know, a squad of twenty or twenty-three players. You, you know, you you want your young ones to to play a part um, to you know give the older players uh, a bit of a freshen up for the A League or the or the Champions League, depending which way you go. You saw Tony Popovich with Western um, Western Sydney just kind of you know swap the swap the whole team. Um, you know, a whole new eleven in the Champions League. And, Gave two boys a go where we kind of just always try to play our best team. Um, and the biggest thing is, you know, momentum. If you're winning, um, you know, you're all tired. You just, you know, you just recover during the training sessions and you play another game. And um, you know, like I said, momentum's a big thing. Um, you know, you've got the confidence. You keep playing. You keep winning. You get the next game, and you don't worry about really anything other than just being on a roll. So momentum's a big thing. If you're losing, then it's a different story. So. Um, yeah, you just got to, the coaches are obviously just got to um, try to freshen this up um, as, as best you can to, to be at maximum during game time. Mm. When you are runners up in the Champions League, but because Gamba Osaka won the league, Adelaide United assumed the host spot, so you were able to go through to the FIFA Club World Cup. Um, yeah, correct. If, so you lost to Gamba Osaka 1-0. But this game, if you had won that, you would have gone to play Manchester United in the semi-final. Do you ever think, gee, what an opportunity that would have been? Yeah, for sure. I remember, um, you know, I remember that game pretty clearly as well. And that thing they went up on in the first half, and in the second half, we really dominated. We had a lot of chances. I think Travis had a really good chance. I think Robbie Eunice came on, and he had a really good chance. Maybe Cristiano as well, um, and we could have easily got an equaliser. Just didn't didn't fall in for us. So. Um, yeah, we could have uh, we could have played yeah, Manchester United next time. I think after our game, game we stayed back, and I think Man- Manchester United played someone um, after us, and we ended up watching that, that, that game. Um, Cristiano Ronaldo played. Um, it was just one of those things that would have been great, but it just never happened. Why do you think the FIFA Club World Cup doesn't really get or hasn't gotten a lot of recognition? It seems, especially for like European teams, it's it's a bigger deal per se to win the Champions League than to actually win the FIFA Club World Cup. Because in theory, for a club to win the FIFA Club World Cup is really the biggest award a team couldn't win. Yeah, uh, yeah, it comes down to the competition. I think you know, um, you you win two or three games and, and you're holding up a trophy. Where you know, if you're playing in, in your league, you have to win thirty games or if you're playing in the UEFA Champions League, you, you know you, you have to play a lot of games and a lot of quality games to win it. Um, you know, FIFA World, uh, the, the Club World Cup. You know, you win three games and, and you're holding up a trophy. It's probably that kind of feeling. It's a bit like for us, you know, winning an FFA Cup game. FFA Cup is different to winning a championship because you know there's six games involved in an FFA Cup. Three of those are probably against local teams, and you win two or three A League teams, and you're holding up a trophy as well. So. It's probably the, the competition where there's not too many games um, and then you're holding up a trophy after winning you know, three or four games. So it's probably that kind of thing mm. rather than you know being the best club in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But then the year after this 2008 Champions League, you make the grand final and obviously two years prior, Adelaide United got absolutely swept in the grand final. But 2009 was a very, very good season. You finished second. You lose 6-0 aggregate in semi-final against victory. 
but then you beat the Brisbane Raw, who back then was still Queensland Raw in the prelim. Grand final at Marvel Stadium back then was the Telstra Dome. 53,000 people at the grand final against a very good victory side, but that was like you had a good side yourself. You know, Travis Dodd, Lucas Pantelis, Cassio, Robbie Cornthwaite yourself. What was it in that game that you just you just couldn't quite get there? Because that seems like, in terms of A-League, that was the moment for Adelaide United to win a championship. And Melbourne victory have won the A-League championship for a second time. The home faithful can now co- proclaim victory is ours. They've completed the triple crown, pre-season cup, Premier's plates, and now the grand final in one season. The antagonism continues until the end. Adelaide, the bridesmaids again, and for the second time in three years, Melbourne victory are the champions of Australia. Like you said, we had a very good team, not just that, uh, you know, those players you just mentioned, I think we're all at a really good age. We're, like, we're at our peak, we're in our like, mid to late 20s, um, and you know, we're all at our peak, like I said. Um, the game, you know, from the first minute, the fruit go our way. I, you know, I don't really like making excuses, but we had a player sent off to Cristiano. We, you know, obviously um, the decision was made, and we played the majority of the game with ten men. Um, oh, yeah, the red the card. They, they, um, they scored, and after they scored, I remember Agostino having, having a really good chance late in the game. I think Travis Dodd had a really good chance, and in the end, it was a bit like the game, the game where we, we couldn't put, uh, we couldn't take it extra time. Hey guys, quick three-quarter time break here on A5Q. I've got another very special guest coming on the show in a few weeks' time, and it's a name that is loved by all, not just Adelaide Crow supporters, but everyone in the AFL. I had Sam Jacobs on the show. That's right, Big Source Jacobs, 200-plus gamer in the AFL who played for Carlton, the Adelaide Crows, and also GWS. He came on the show, spoke about a lot of different topics throughout his career. Here is a little snippet. No doubt Richmond came to play a lot more than we did. And, yeah, we started the game well, but we probably weren't playing, like you said, how we wanted to. And <clears throat> I think that second quarter, we were able to sort of rally a little bit. We went in at nine points down at half time, but it felt like we were down by nine goals at half time. Like, the rooms were just really flat. And I think everyone was sort of a bit shell-shocked. And like you said, like, we were sort of the warm favourites going into the game. And But Richmond, you know, as we've learned now, are, are one of the greatest teams of the modern modern era. And... Um, they obviously played the game on their terms and how they wanted to, and um, they've been able to replicate that since. So, you know, for us, it was, once again, a lot of learnings. And um, they probably, the game goes really quickly. Um, so you sort of got to really cash in when it's your moment because the game flies by and you just got to make sure you take all the opportunities you can. Trust me when I say you're going to want to listen to the full episode. Won't be available for a couple of weeks, but it'll be worth it when it comes. But let's get back to Eugene Galekovic for now. Is that something? Does that game still bother you, or have you sort of because you've won, you won one seven years later? Does it make up for it, or do you still look at that grand final and does it still bother you? Uh, it doesn't bother me. Obviously, at the time it was, it was upsetting, um, and it would have been good to, to win it. Um, but I'm not grants it's one of those games. Games can go either way, um, and it was an opportunity there for us to take it. We didn't take it, so. Um, I see it as an opportunity, but in the end, it, it is what it is. The referee makes a decision. Goals don't go in. Um, I don't remember their goal where I, was, I couldn't see the ball until really late. Uh, so all those little things play a big part in, in you know, which way the game goes. In the end, it did go our way. It was probably played a high mark. Um, you know, the red card probably wouldn't have been given. Um, it would have, a lot of things probably might have gone our way. Who, who, who knows? You know what I mean? So. Um, it's just one of those things that you, you kind of have to move on and um, go on to the next thing. Just before the championship in, in 2016, you have a very good side under Josep Gombau, but you're just not able to, to proceed through to a grand final. What was it in that, particularly that 2014-15 season when you finished third and you lost the semi-final to Sydney FC? It was almost like Melbourne victory, Sydney FC... And then you were just that that one step below them. What do you think it was that you just weren't able to get through to a grand final? I think you know when Yossi took over. I think we were in a state we were, we were really building. Um, the first year, I think we um, you 
you know, we didn't win for a while and then we started winning late and you could see something was building. The second year, we got a little better and you just had that feeling where we were just building. We probably, like you said, Sydney FC and Big Tree were probably just a bit better than us at the time. Um, and I think Central Coast in that first year. Um, but then really had that sense of really building something and um, getting close to, you know, getting to that stage where Sydney were or even better. So, um, you know, it wasn't like why we weren't better. It was, I think, we're building to be better. Yeah, because the year after, obviously, Guillermo Moore takes over, you're winless after, I think, nine games. And then surely at that point in the season, are you thinking at that point we can still win a championship, or are you thinking, gee, this is we're in a whole lot of trouble here? I didn't think we're in trouble. Um, I think the, the mentality was we could still make the finals rather than we don't really. Um, you know, we we were last, we hadn't won the game, but we're only you know if you're on a bit of a roll, we do jump a lot of spots on the table, and I think that's how I was thinking. I think. You know, I was injured at the time. I think we had a lot of boys injured early on. Kuriska uh, was injured as well. Um, so we thought, if we get some boys back and, and go on a bit of a roll, we could sneak into the finals and, and cause a bit of damage if we know we're on a roll. That, that was my thinking. And, um, you know, in saying that, we, we that's what happened. We won a game, got some belief back um, in round nine against Perth Glory. And then um, it was about making finals. And then we were, we were kind of like around that, you know, six mark. We were like, can we make the top four and get a home final? And then we got kind of got there with, you know, five games to go or so. And then it was top two. And then it was, maybe we can win it. And in the end, um, um, you know, Mel Victory just a favour in the last game of the season in um, getting a result against Brisbane. And we, we snuck uh, with them in the top spot. The two finals, of course, Melbourne City in the semi... Probably, in my opinion, the, the best atmosphere at Hindmarsh Stadium. That was an incredible game. When Bruce Gitte scored that goal, it was like, here we go, we're going to a grand final. Yeah, I, I think, you know, even during the season, I think, you know, that end part of the, um, the league, I think it, it, that feeling where we're going to win it, I, I, don't, it was just, I don't know if it was just me or, you know, other boys were thinking about it. I just had that feeling where no one's going to, we're going to win this and no one's going to stop us. Uh, especially when we made the finals and we finished um, in the uh, top spot, I thought it's going to be very hard for anyone to beat us, especially if we get top spot playing every game in Adelaide. I thought it um, doesn't matter who we played, I think we're going to win. And, uh, you know, Melbourne City um, at High Marsh, knowing Western Sydney, they had that new semi final against Brisbane where I think it was 4 3 or 5 4 or something like that. And they might have played their final in that semi final. And knowing um, if we if we turned up and, and played at our best, that no one was going to beat us in that final. And what are your memories of the grand final? Adelaide Oval, which is, you know, an AFL ground, cricket ground, but it was electric that day. 50,000, as I said, and, and when uh, when SAS scored that, that free kick, is that right yeah. up there with the best? So off we go, a packed house at Adelaide Oval. Oh, Bruce Cabell for Adelaide United! The SAS from Eugene Delakovic. He knows the pain that they've been through. And in front of 50,000 parochial South Australians, Adelaide United have finally reversed the curse and laid to rest those ghosts at Grand Finals Pass. Bottom in November, Premiers in April, Champions in May. Yeah, for sure. I think the, the best memory was probably when uh, uh, Pablo Sanchez scored the third goal knowing the that we had won it. Um, it was late in the game, it was 3 1, pretty much. Um, that, that was a goal that won us the you know, won us the title, obviously. We could relax a bit in the last few minutes and, and enjoy the joy the moment. But Adelaide Oval is a fantastic venue when you, you know for it. even for our game, when we're sold out like that and you know, fifty thousand people cheering, it's, it's amazing. Um, so you know, it was a unbelievable time, unbelievable few weeks leading to that final. Um, and when you win a championship, because obviously you were sort of at the tail end of your career, is it more relief that you've, you've got it? Because you mentioned you don't really feel a part of it in 2007. 
is it relief I've got one? Yeah, no, it's definitely a relief. It wasn't so much because I hadn't won one. It was probably so much because I was at the club for so long and we hadn't won a championship. So it was about, you know, being at the club for nine years or more at the time. And I didn't want to... It would have been probably unfulfilling if I left Adelaide United and hadn't won any in nine years. Oh, it's like it should be nine years, I think. I'm a seventh best mate club. It's great winning it, but it's you're winning, you're holding up a trophy after winning five games where, you know, putting... You know, blood, sweat, and tears in a whole season, 27 games plus finals, and it's very hard to do. And um, it's more of a relief being at the club for so long, and at least having one one championship. Um, that was probably um, the most uh, precious thing to me. Just on your international career, because we're actually running out of time now, but you've been to two FIFA World Cups. Obviously, you didn't get to play in either of the World Cups, but 2010 was kind of like the tail end of that golden generation per se. I mean, I know Baduka wasn't there, but you still had Harry Kuehl and Lucas Neal, Schwarzer, Vince Grella, Bresciano. And then in 2014 was like a changing of times because it wasn't it wasn't so much about those guys. It was more, that, you know, your Mille Yednags and your Tim Cahills, James Troisi. What is it like to actually feel I'm going to a World Cup? And, you know, when you're there... And the national anthem's playing, and you've arrived. Can you explain that emotion? Yeah, so it's uh, it's pretty special. Um, you know, you're just representing your country. Um, you know, I do that in the East Asian Games. Uh, it's pretty special, but obviously, to do it at, at a, you know the biggest event in the world is uh, you know, more special. And uh, you know, it's it you know it brings you chills, it gives you goosebumps every time you hear the national anthem. Um, you know, to be in the World Cup, you know, against, you know, teams like Chile, Spain, um, you know, big, big European countries, big South American um, countries, um, you know, it's the pinnacle of our, our game. So, yeah, just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm obviously um, happy to be involved with, uh, you know, two World Cups. So, um, loved every moment. It's a very, um, you know, two very different camps were involved, involved in. Obviously, one was, um, you know, under Tim Verbeek, one was under Ange Postecoglou, so in terms of the football, um, very different, but um, you know, the calibre of players that I was, uh, was, I was involved with, um, you know, very special. Are you disappointed you, you never actually got to physically play in a World Cup, though? Um, you know, I've got to understand, you've got to understand your role. Um, you know, in the first one, Mark Schwartz was there, so it was a bit like... You know, I saw myself at the time, you know, as a number three. Um, so it was a kind of, I was, I was only going to play if Schwartzy got into it or, or probably not even because, you know, we still had uh, a number two. So it, it was going to be always very hard to play. You know, when you get the phone call, you know, you go into the World Cup, it's, you know, part of the squad, you know, I'm absolutely wrapped. Um, and I'm not, my mindset was, okay, I'm going to train hard, work hard. And just give it everything rather than I'm going to I'm going to play I want to play it's you got to be realistic sometimes as well um, the second World Cup was with Matty Ryan who was a young goalkeeper if you remember he was a bit under the pump and I thought I might have a chance in that last game um, but in, you know um, Edge gave Matty Ryan that third game as well um, and like I said it's I wouldn't say I'm disappointed I kind of knew my role I knew where I was at the time um, and I just had to push Push and uh, train as hard as I could, and if I got that chance, I had to give my chance that I had to give myself the best chance as possible. If I had to be ready, so um, it just never came. And you finish out your career um, at Melbourne City. You played two seasons there. Your last season, obviously, was 2018-19. When do you, or when did you feel it's all over? I'm, I'm going to hang up the boots. I'm retiring. And when you know in your heart, yep, that's it. Is it relief? Is it sad? How do you how did you figure that out? It, it's sad in terms of you know when you've done something so long that you kind of know it's time. Um, I, you know, during that season, I was umming and ahhing. Um, there was still interest in terms of me re-signing with Melbourne City, um, and at the time I wasn't sure, so I kind of kept putting it off. Um, you know, negotiating because I didn't didn't really know if I, if I really wanted to play, and I think in your head is you're at that stage where you're not sure I think it's time so you know, that's that's where I came to I thought okay I'm 
by the time where it's after Christmas, after New Year, mm. they're trying to talk to me and I'm not sure. And I thought, okay, if I'm not sure, that means it's, it's time to stop, you know. So um, that, that was my thinking behind it. Um, and yeah, I, I, um, that, that was my reasoning. Um, it's sad, like I said, not because I thought I could keep going or not. I just, it's sad because, you know, you've done it for so long. Um, it's going to be, you know, when round one comes the following year, how am I going to feel, you know what I mean? But in saying that, uh, like I said, I'm not young anymore. Uh, it was just time to give it up. We're just going to going to finish up now. If I could, though, I wouldn't mind just asking three questions, and I'll ask them all in, in one hit. Who is, throughout your career, in any team, international, domestic, who is the best player you've ever played with and why? Who is the best player you've played against and why? And who's the best coach you've ever played under and why? Played with um, probably Harry Till, even though it wasn't like club football, it was um, it was the national team, um, and he was you know at that age where he was still producing. Um, against, I'd say it's probably uh, Rivaldo when he was played at Bunyard Court. Um, probably had the best two games that you know what he's achieved in his career. And where he's played is probably, um, you know, the best player I've played against. And the best coach, I'd have to say two. Um, I'd have to say Ex Foster Coglu and uh, Yossip Gombao. Excellent. All right, Eugene, well, thank you very much. It's been a great chat. You are an icon of the A-League and, and probably, well, in my opinion, the greatest uh, goalkeeper we've ever seen in the A-League. And I wish you all the best in everything you're doing now out of football. Thanks for having me, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers. And that's a wrap. Thank you to everyone for tuning into A5Q. Don't forget to spread the word, subscribe, leave a rating. Until next time, old sport.